School Sunday is August 15th. We're gonna have backpack blessings, Sunday school promotions, a cookout, and ice cream truck. <laughs> Third grade Bible Sunday is August 22nd. If you have a third grader, please let Kayla know. Educator and School Staff Sunday is August 29th. Thank you to all of our school staff. This is a great church. Welcome to worship. Amen. Didn't Samuel Spicer do a good job of that? We had fun filming him. This is a great church. Welcome to worship. I'm so glad to see each and every one of you here this morning uh, with just a heart prepared for worship. Uh, and with that said, let's stand and let's go to our Father in song. I 
can see his strongholds coming down. I can see his strongholds coming down. I can see Jesus reaching out, reaching out. Sing that one more time. I can see his strongholds coming down. I can see his strongholds coming down. I can see Jesus reaching out, reaching out. Amen. Awaken my soul. Please be seated. 
Good morning. Welcome to worship. I'm Aubrietta Jones, one of the pastors here. And the time has come in the service for us to have our giving moment. I uh, want to share the giving information on the screen. And those that are here or those that are worshiping with us in their homes can give in that manner. As, uh, as you're looking at that information, I want to share with you, you also have, if you're here today, you also have your attendance slip, and I want you to complete that. And I want to let you know that on the back, there is information we're trying to get. If you, if you are an educator, or if you're on a school staff, or if you know someone in the church that is an educator or on the school staff, if you know someone who is entering the third grade, uh, we are trying to get the information to make sure we have everybody included for third grade Bibles and for teacher and school staff appreciation. And so you can put those on your attendance slips and you drop these attendance slips in as we collect the morning offering. And so uh, that would be great. I appreciate you all doing that. Uh, as, as we think about our giving, I want to share with you that uh, this weekend I, I had the privilege to speak with a dear saint of the church, a, a precious, precious person. And one of the things she talked about was how much she loved the church and how that the church had helped her through all of life's ups and downs. The church is there for people in the midst of marriage. The church is there for people in the midst of uh, trying to raise children. The church is there for people when they lose their job and they don't know what they're going to do next. The church is there for people when marriages end uh, for, through uh, uh, being widowed or through divorce. Whatever happens, the church is there. The church is there for us in illness. And the church is there in the midst of our greatest joys and triumphs to celebrate along with us. Uh, the church is really like a family, and your giving makes it possible for us to continue to do ministry together and offer opportunities for people to bond with one another and to grow deep in their faith. We get to be the church because giving is part of being the church, and you have committed to that. So I thank you for your faithfulness in giving. I thank you for joining me in supporting the church. This is a great church. And it's wonderful to get to be a part of it. Uh, in just a moment, after Pastor Brent offers the pastoral prayer, the offering, uh, will, the offering plates will circulate, or you can use the information on the screen to give. Uh, it is a privilege to support the church. And you can put your attendance slips in when you put in your offering. Thank you. Good morning. I don't think anybody has a problem hearing me on this microphone, do they? <laughs> if you're having a problem hearing me, raise your hand. If you can hear me, then you shouldn't be raising your hand. It's an old joke. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. What does it take, O oh God, of wind and flame to ignite our lives? O oh Lord of us all, you are the God of many languages. As you sing the language of joy with us, you join us in the dance of life. You hear all your children sing and dance and praise your mighty love this morning, especially those who celebrate new life with all the possibilities of the future, those who celebrate relationships, both the new and exciting and the long-term yet still exciting ones. Those for whom the wonder of life fills their being to the limit. We pray that they will hear your voice. And yet, O oh God, you speak to us during the times of pain, of sorrow, of fear, of despair. Hear your children who speak to you, who cry out, who whisper in the languages to you this day. All those suffering with COVID or its effects, hear their prayer. Those who find themselves in hospital beds or waiting anxiously beside those beds, hear their prayer. Those who gather to say farewell to one who is traveling or one who is moving, hear their prayer. Those who gather at graveside to say that long farewell, hear their prayer. Those who worry about where the next meal or the next rent check will come from, hear their prayer. 
those who live in places where peace is just a word, a faint hope, a distant dream, hear their prayer. May all those languages be filled by the pain you hear from us, gathering them unto yourself. We pray as people of your spirit who light our fires, who fill our lungs with air, who blow us out into the world to live and serve. And now we pray the prayer that your son taught us so long ago by praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. so much. So we are continuing a series of messages called Amazing Animals in the Bible, and I learned something just this morning 
people need a reminder that insects actually scientifically qualify as animals, right? This discussion has come up more times today than I expected. It's kind of funny, but uh, it's the kingdom of animalia, right? So insects are in the, the animal kingdom, and uh, that's, that's been a fun little learning uh, for us this morning because we're talking about the ant today. Uh, the ant is our final in the series of amazing animals in the Bible, and there are several different passages that feature ants in the Bible, or a few at least in the book of Proverbs. Ants are amazing. They're so organized. They they, a lay person cannot observe their communication. Uh, scientists kind of know and understand. You can read about it if you have the right, uh, if you have the right materials, you can figure all this out. But uh, that's, uh, that's one of the great things about ants is that they, they can work together as a unit. And they do that through nonverbal means of communication. Uh, there is not uh, an obvious there's not an obvious uh, boss among them when we see them, and uh, that's, that's amazing. All the same, most of us really don't like ants, and it would make you sad to know that as many as 20 million ants can live in one ant colony. Uh, that's not something we like. We don't like the fact that they bite. We don't like the fact that it seems like that they're unhygienic, but uh, still, they're very productive. So we may not like ants, but we have to admire that. And the author of the passage we're going to read today admires something less than he admires an ant, and that is a sluggard. What is a sluggard? We're about to learn. Hear now the reading. Proverbs 6, beginning with the sixth verse. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, and yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. Wow. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The, the qualities of a sluggard. A sluggard is a human being, by the way, and maybe one that is not being very diligent. Uh, we, we see here it talks about a little rest, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands. And, and other passages talk about other things, talks about fear, uh, lions being in the street or something like that uh, that somebody might imagine. There might be a lion out there, so I've got to stay home and I can't go to work today. Or uh, people being jealous of others and how much easier their lives are. That's a quality of a sluggard. All these things are featured in the book of Proverbs about a sluggard. But ultimately, to kind of summarize, a sluggard is someone who is not diligent because they are procrastinating. They are procrastinating in doing tasks that they know must be done, and so they don't do it. Um, the harvest comes, and they don't harvest. Um, they they uh, might go hunting, but they don't dress the animal after this. They don't prepare it for eating, and it rots. Such is the action of a sluggard. And the sluggard is being described in a time when people had an almost hand-to-mouth existence. I mean, Every day had to count to keep them alive. Every day had to count to keep their families fed. And this kind of procrastination could cost lives. It could make people homeless. It could cause death. A, a 2013 study of procrastination tells us that procrastination is more about the immediate urgency of managing a negative mood about something that must be done than anything else. It's not, it's laziness maybe, but it's not just laziness. It's the negative feeling about whatever must be done. The feeling of inadequacy. The feeling that uh, the task will not be enjoyable. The feeling that perhaps there's some resentment that's, that, that maybe somebody else doesn't have to do such a task. Those kinds of thoughts are the things that make us procrastinate. And for the sluggard, uh, that procrastination is going to hurt him very much in this passage, the sluggard he's speaking of. We, I got to say, when you think about 
the sluggard in the passage we just read, the one that just doesn't get around to harvest and just doesn't get around to uh, getting the crops put up in time, there is a sense in which in our society we love to hate the sluggard. Somebody who's too lazy to get a job, somebody who's too lazy and, and sometimes you hear other negative things. Sometimes that stereotype, sadly, is attached to somebody of a certain ethnic group. Sometimes that kind of stereotyping uh, goes right along with some kind of a comment about government programs. People can identify someone else who is a sluggard and we want to judge that person. But what I want to tell you, beloved church, is that there is some area in your life and in my life where every single one of us are sluggards. I don't know what it is for you. I have a few ideas about what it might be for me. But there's some area in our lives where we procrastinate because we resent something, because we think something's going to be unpleasant, because we feel inadequate to the task. All of us in some area of our lives are sluggards. It doesn't have to be limited to the workplace and to work activity. And so whether work is your problem or not, there's some area where you and I procrastinate when there is no reason to do so. And if we're not careful, we will miss the opportunities we have to do things that must get done. And I understand how we become kind of sluggardly because there are so many choices and so many distractions today and so many ways to put off the things that must be done. Now, why does this matter for a Christian to talk about? God is not mentioned in this passage one time. I don't know if you notice the ant. I mean, we know God made the ant, but God's not mentioned in this passage. Why does it matter for a faithful person to care whether or not they are a sluggard? Well, beloved, God planned and designed our lives in such a way that he allows us to partner with him in building our lives. When God created humanity, he, he told them to uh, subdue the nature around them. He told them to be fruitful and multiply. He wanted them to build a life. The glory of God in you and in me calls us to build a life, to use the creativity he has given us, to use the gifts and abilities he's given us to fashion a life with his help, with his guidance and his wisdom and his discernment. He will not hand us a life. He will not hand us uh, a home. He will not hand us a family. He will not hand us the things that we are called to go out and pursue. And God glorifies in us using our abilities in this way. God wants us to enjoy and delight in the work that is ahead of us, to enjoy and delight in the accomplishments that we can achieve with him. Ecclesiastes 2.24 says we should eat and drink and take pleasure in our work. God wants to see us do this. This is pleasing in his sight. And so it matters. It matters when we waste the talents and the abilities he has given us. It matters when we are not diligent with the blessings he's given us, and the result is that we ruin them, they, we fritter them away, and they disappear. God wants us to be industrious. Not workaholics, but industrious. Industrious in our work life, industrious in our personal life, industrious even perhaps with our hobbies and the things that we pursue for the sake of pursuing them. God delights in that. God delights in that. And so it, is, it behooves all of us to think about how to attack procrastination and how to attack the feelings behind procrastination in our own hearts and minds. How do we get past resentment? How do we get past a sense of inadequacy? How do we get past just the awareness that there's stuff we don't want to do? How do we act more like an ant? How do we do it? The first thing we have to do is see where it is that we have a problem. See where it is that we have a problem and call it what it is. I'm procrastinating right here in this area of my life. And I'll tell you, you know, uh, the, when you, you do that, the bad attitudes and the reasons that we're not acting, th those become pretty evident. Uh, uh, confession time here. A few years back, I was chosen for jury duty. 
I wasn't, well, I say I was chosen. I was, you know, the random selection. I was in the pool where the people had to be chosen to be on a jury. Now, I claim to love my country. I claim to love freedom. I claim to love the idea that everybody gets their day in court. These are things I say about myself until I was chosen for jury duty. I, it was a busy time in my life. I had all kinds of excuses. There was other stuff I needed to work on. Uh, I had been sick, and so I was a little bit behind on some things, and it was a, a busy, busy time, and, and who knows when you're going to have to go in. And It's like I was trying to make plans for that fall that, that this happened. It was a really busy fall, and I couldn't hardly make plans because I knew if I made my plans, suddenly I was going to have to cancel them all if I actually got selected for a jury. And God forgive me, I started thinking about all the things that might qualify me to get out of jury duty, right? I started thinking about like, you know, really, I mean, pastors don't always have a great reputation, right? Are, are they going to want a preacher on their jury? Some people have a positive experience of ministers and some people kind of don't. And so I was thinking, you know, maybe the defendant had some kind of hellfire and brimstone preacher growing up and he's not going to want me on the jury. This is what I'm thinking, you know. I'm thinking, well, uh, other people seem like they could get up when they, were, when they were sifting through all of us and trying to figure out who needed to be excused. Other people got up and talked about how busy they were and some of them actually did get excused. And so I was hoping, right, I was hoping. And then I started thinking about the privileges I have received as, as a citizen of this country. And I started thinking about the importance of a jury and how I would feel if the only people on my jury were people who were not smart enough to figure out how to get out of jury duty. You know? I mean, for real, you want some people in there that could have figured out how to get off of jury duty, but just on the principle of the thing, decided not to do that. And so I realized that I was being a sluggard about jury duty, and I stopped worrying about that. And I was not selected for a jury, but if, I'm ever, if I ever am part of the pool again uh, for jury duty, I'm just going to go, and whatever has to get canceled is going to get canceled, and I'm going to do that jury duty because that is my responsibility as a citizen of this country. And it's yours too, sorry. It is. So, so it, identifying the things that we put off that matters and asking ourselves why we're putting them off. And there's a lot of things that we can easily put off that, uh, we, that, that nobody is going to mention us. And I'm going to mention a few of them here today. What about some tough conversations that only you know you need to have? Maybe there is somebody that you need to broach a difficult subject with and you don't want to do it, but you know you have to. Why is it that that's so hard? We feel inadequate. We feel like it's going to be uncomfortable. It's one of those things that just has to be done. And you can't overthink it. You just have to do it. What about health issues? How many of you have gotten your physicals and all the things that you're supposed to do for your health? How many of you are doing that on time? How many of you are taking medicine that's been prescribed if you have that situation? How many of you are being active in the plan that is in front of you to keep you in good shape, to use the gift of your body, the physical resource that God has given you so that you can continue living this life and thriving. We don't want to go to the doctor. We don't want to spend the money. We don't want to find a health problem. We don't want to take pills. Maybe they make somebody feel like they're old. We don't want to exercise because we'd rather just sit down. We don't want to eat a certain way. All of that might be true, but a little rest, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands, and suddenly a small health problem is a big health problem. It's not just about finances where we can become a sluggard. This is one that people really don't want to talk about, but how about getting your affairs in order in case something happens to you? Do you know that less than half of the adults in the United States of America have any kind of a will at all? And only something like 75% of people over 65 have a will. And uh, if you're uh, younger, if you have kids living in your home, you know, a, a plan for where they would go if something were to happen to you. This is part of what it means to be a grown-up. And most people just don't, we don't want to talk about that. That's unpleasant, right? 
The problem is the fact that it's all unpleasant doesn't change the reality that we need it. Our sulking changes very little about reality. The only thing it changes is the role we play in it. We can procrastinate and put off stuff we don't want to do, or we can get in there and just do it and not overthink it and not overanalyze it, but just know that one way or the other, it has to be done. And that is the glory of the ant, that it does what has to be done. An ant is so adaptable. Do you know ants can actually change their, their bodies? Their bodies can kind of morph and change in size and shape to do the things that must be done for the colony. The unity of that colony and the survival of that colony, that's so important. And that's, that's what they are. They will do anything to keep everything going. It's, I don't know if it's an instinct. I don't even know what you call it but it is amazing. I want to be more like that ant. I still don't like ants, but I want to be more like that ant. I want to think less about creaturely comforts, about likes and dislikes. I want to think less about preferences, and I want to think more about living the life that I ought to be living each and every day. I want to be that person that doesn't procrastinate so much. I want to be that person that's not hesitating because we look for perfection in things, but is just moving forward because good enough is good enough and it will be done. I want to be more like the ant. And I really think God wants me to be more like the ant. I don't like ants still. I can't, I can't say that I'm a fan of ants. But what I am a fan of is going home to a quiet place and spending a few minutes and having a real heart-to-heart -heart with ourselves and making a list. What is it that I'm putting off that needs to be done? What conversation? What task? What chore around the house? What chore with my health? What chore with my finances? And uh, what, what chore with my family? What is it that I just mean to do that I just never quite get around to? What are the problems? And how can I tackle them? How can I get started? How can I make the first step? And when is the deadline for the last step? Set those on the calendar, make the plan, and tackle it. And if, it, if the going is tough, we don't reward ourselves beforehand. We reward ourselves at the very end. Give yourself a reward when you've finished the task because you're finished. You know, procrastination really at its core, it's a form of self-harm. It's a form of self-harm, and it is a terrible feeling because it's that feeling that deep down while we're relaxing or doing whatever we're doing to not do what it is we're supposed to be doing, we know in the back of our mind it's sitting there. It's just waiting. It's waiting for us to act or not act, and we know we're doing wrong. It doesn't sound a lot like the freedom that God wants to give us. It doesn't sound a lot like the blessings of Christ that God wants to give us, wants to pour into our lives. But we can reach them at any time if we just decide to take the first step. Get an accountability partner and invite them uh, to work on something that they need to work on as well. And take the steps and call each other and tell each other how you're doing. God longs for you to have a beautiful and abundant life. A life that you can look at and say, I built that with God's help. I made the decisions. I discerned. I put in the work. I put in the effort. I put in the time. I built the relationships. This is the life we have built. God longs for that for you, and God longs for that for me. And I think if we give ourselves to that kind of a task with the diligence of that, the diligence of that ant, we're going to find that we bless ourselves and we bless the people around us by living a life of purpose, living a life on purpose, living a life that is focused. May God bless us on our journey. Amen.
standard sing. Christ, go forth to love and serve God and your neighbor in all that you do, and may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Amen.